Hi, my name is Deborah Johnson, and this is Lesson 11. Um, we are um, doing a series on practical application of Romans 6, 7, and 8. And specifically, we're going over um, in this lesson um, the verses in Romans 7 that explain the sin cycle. What we want to do is um, get a little more detailed explanation from the verses about the sin cycle. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity. Help us to have an open heart and an open mind to really be able to see our own selves as you do. Um, allow ourselves to be humbled and see that our flesh is unable to produce any works that are acceptable to you. And when we're doing it, we need to change our mind. We need to allow you to change our mind by yielding. In your precious son's name, amen. Okay, um, what we're going to do is start off with just a basic overview. What is the sin cycle? Well, it is a um, natural cycle that happens um, as we believe Satan's lie. I can do it. Or, I am a god. I can do it on my own. Um, we do this without any real training. It is just how we respond. And the pathways in our brain get reinforced by our experiences. We do it over and over and over so that we don't really see what we're doing. <clears throat> what God's doing by bringing in the law is it helps to show us that we're sinners and we fall short. Um, sin remains no matter how hard we try. Uh, it prompts more depravity and we get angrier and anger. It's a cycle and it never ends. In fact, it gets more grievous. The more we put it aside, the more angrier we get and it, the more it spills out and uh, kind of like you holding your finger in a dike and once it's, the pressure builds to a certain point, it just bursts out all over everything. And that's what happens. We can fool ourselves for a while, but really we just can't keep the law. Um, okay. It, you know, the law also seems to be a, like a dangling carrot. It is keep, it keeps being held out in front of us and we look at it and think, ah, I can get it. I can get it. I can, if I just try harder. And that is Satan's lure. It's the lie that we can do it ourselves and don't need God. Um, usually if we do finally resolve that we need help from God. It's usually some major event like uh, the Twin Towers uh, being um, burned down. Um, everybody is talking about God and praying for God's help and, and this for that very short period of time. All of a sudden, there's God in their lives. And then as soon as they get past that, God set aside, they go on living uh, on their own. We all do it. And, but that's a good visual example um, that everybody can look back and see and notice. Everybody's verbiage changed during that time. Everything was about praying and, and blessing you and um, uh, being concerned for their, their brothers and sisters. But um, after that, it just kind of went back, it lulled back to sleep into that same system. Okay. Um, Try as we may, the law is elusive and frustrating. Um, in the Old Testament, there's many, many examples. One good example of someone understanding um, that they can't produce any good on their own is in Genesis 17 when God asked Abraham, walk before me and be thou perfect. And what did he do? He fell on his face. He knew he couldn't do it. God's watching. He, he knows it's the perfect standard better than anyone. He'd see any little mistake, and Abraham didn't even try. He fell on his face. However, the opposite, Israel, 
uh, the nation Israel uh, when God tried to test to see if they understood what he was teaching them um, instead of falling on their face they said all that we that thou sayest we will do and in the forefront it seems like gee that was a good response they're gonna try but that's not what God wants he wants their heart he wants their heart abased humbled and exalting him as God when they say we will do it they're exalted and their works are exalted and we know what their their works are their filthy rags to God that's what Isaiah says um, there's many examples uh, in Matthew 6 5 we see the Pharisee exalting himself when he's praying so everyone can see him and, and give him ex exaltation and uh, adoration for all the prayers that he's doing um, the Lord Jesus Christ said he will get his reward in this life he won't get it in the next life um, similarly let's go to Luke 18 9 through 14 and see an example of many examples <clears throat> um, verse 9 and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others two men went up into the temple to pray the one a Pharisee and the other a publican the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself God I thank thee that I am not as other men are extortioners unjust adulterers or even as this publican I fast twice in a week I give tithes of all that I possess now that's an exceedingly high-minded he's trying to be good he's trying to be better than everyone else comparing himself with others he's not wise and let's see what the publican says in verse 13 and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven but smote upon his breast saying God be merciful to me a sinner I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other rather than the Pharisee for everyone that exalt, exalteth himself shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted you know we see a similar thing in Romans 2 uh, the Apostle Paul um, helps bring home this same idea uh, Romans chapter 2 verse 28 for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly neither is that circumcision which is one outward in the flesh but he is a Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God God wants your heart attitude he wants it to come from here Abraham he he wasn't going to exalt him his himself he decided to humble himself and exalt God and that's what he wants. he had the heart attitude of faith um, and that's what God wants for for us however <clears throat> the sin cycle is the exaltation of self and, and and our own efforts our own works to be to be seen of men to be seen as righteous to its religiousness is what it is man's efforts unto God and that's really what uh, what he's doing he's holding forth his efforts as a sacrifice to God look what I've done and that is unacceptable that's the sin cycle <clears throat> when will it stop it'll stop when we hit rock bottom when we realize we just cannot do it we will continue Satan's lie I can do it <clears throat> and we will have a grievously empty life with no rewards for any of that and it's very tiring our, our efforts and frustrating and we become angry and bitter uh, this process will continue until we finally admit that we need God the lies ties us up binds us as a slave to sin um, we are not able and we're not we're not able to continue the righteous standard of God or even start the righteous standard of God and it eludes us 
and it deceives us. We sometimes trick ourselves into thinking that it's acceptable when it's not. Okay, <clears throat> let's go to Romans 7 now, and we're going to read through the verses, and we are going to actually look at the sin cycle, and we're going to go step by step. Um, I hope you have your handouts. I, I hope you're looking at them as we go through each step. And we're going to move along and go through the verses. So the first one is, as the law enters, sin is manifest. And let's read Romans 7, 7 through 10. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except for the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And, uh, let's see, and the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. So um, we're reading here through verse, verse 10, uh, 7 through 10. And the first verse, it talks about the law of coveting. And this is the example, as we talked about last week, uh, last uh, lesson, that um, Paul uses as this example of coveting um, as a law that he tried to keep. Uh, when the law enters the thoughts of your mind, it becomes a standard of required behavior to acquire, to attain unto. It's, it's right up here and you're going to try to gain it. You're trying to conquer it um, and then to maintain that by fleshly efforts. It's designed, the law is designed to show you you can't keep it, um, that you, you sin. We all fall short. It's the why in the road, really. Which way are you going? And how are you doing it? Are you doing it? Are you doing it as a believer, walking by faith? Or are you doing it? following sin, the path of sin, um, in your own efforts, by the law. That's what you want to think about as you're thinking about this, this sin cycle. Because going down the road of your own self-effort, it's not pleasing to God. There's no victory, and it burns away. Um, verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Sin is not dead when you try to keep it, and then all of a sudden you are living that sin. It uses an opportunity, the opportunity of the law to energize and make alive sin. Um, before it was dormant, or we didn't see it, it we've... We've um, fooled ourselves. We're just unaware. Verse 9, for I was alive without the law once. As you're walking down that path of godliness, um, what's, what's happening is you're alive and you're living unto Christ. Christ is living in you and through you. However, when, the, when sin, sin enters, when it comes, sin revives and you die. And so, that's anything that you're producing burns away. And that's what that's saying. And I, I would uh, encourage you to think about what that word died and I died. How did Paul die there? Um, and in verse 10, the next verse, and the commandment which was ordained to life, that was what it was. It was ordained to life. I found to be unto death. As you try to live it, it just produces sin. So be thinking about what those words mean a little bit more clearly and how it relates to you as a, a believer. Obviously in our spirit and when we're walking 
unto the Lord and yielding to God. It we're not living and, and we're not dying. We're not um, finding anything unto death as Christ living in us. It's only when we put ourselves under that performance system and try in our own efforts. Okay. As sin is exalted and magnified, the law brings that um, that behavior that's unacceptable, and therefore um, it burns away. Think about Romans eight six: to be carnally, carnally minded brings death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace. Um, we are bringing forth an imitation religiousness. This is what Satan wants. That's what he started back in Genesis 3. Okay. The second, after the law enters, the second, second issue is self-exaltation. And we're trying in our own effort in, in uh, Romans 7, 11. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Paul's, Paul's um, spiritual life, was it, was it functioning the way God meant it to? Or was, was he off track now? He was off track and he was living unto sin and death. It, there was no fruit produced any longer in that area of his life as he's coveting. And he's trying to stop that coveting. <clears throat> so, as we, um, the commandment manifests our efforts, it's a deceiver. And um, our, our pride gets in the way. And we become blinded to the truth. And we still see that carrot. And we still try going down that, um, to the left of the Y in the road, we try to... Um, gain acceptance from God, really to be as gods as um, Adam and Adam and Eve did. Um, it's a, a time waster, um, and it steals all our energy and our focus. And now we're no longer living unto Christ, but we're living unto our flesh. <clears throat> it's putting putting on display. The opposite of what Christ wants put on display. Christ is being put on display in and through us, his word, uh, when we yield to him. But when we are under the law, when we're in this sin cycle, this, this spiral downhill sin cycle, we're really putting on display man's way and religion. And so, verse 12 Wherefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Uh, we can't blame the law for anything. There's no fault to be found in the law. It's perfect and righteous. Um, it's really in our own self. Okay. And that's the failure that happens. The failure down here, the failure of the flesh in, in, in our, and sin is manifest in, in Romans 7, 11 through 13. It says uh, in 11, it deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy, just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, it wasn't to make make um, make uh, the law death to me. What it was made is to manifest sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. And so what we want is we want, uh, God wants, us to see sin for what it is, our behavior. It doesn't measure up, and it should um, make us ill. It should make us feel sick. It's not who we are. It's not Christ. It's contrary to Christ, and we should realize that at that point. As sin is being manifest, say, that's not who I am in Christ, and allow Christ 
to take you off that path as you yield to him and put you on the other path. However, um, what our, our flesh does, it exalts itself. And the failure creates condemnation. Instead of a change of mind, it creates emotion and fail, feeling of failure and not measuring up and guilt. And so that's what this next section is. And that is the bottom here, condemnation and guilt in Romans 7, 14 through 15. 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The law is of God. There's nothing bad about it, but we're the ones. We're the problems. That's what it should be teaching us. As we're contemplating the sin cycle and thinking about it, we should be thinking, it's not God. I shouldn't be mad at God or mad at anybody around me. I I need to be realize it's sin that's really fleshly thinking in my mind and I'm allowing that to control me and so we're sold and just a slave to sin is that what we want to do it's contrary to who we are verse 15 for that which I do I allow not for what I would that do I not but what I hate that do I and so um, in 15 here it's the very thing that we hate is what we do um, we're driven to do good but we don't find that good we we do what we hate and it is really reigning in our lives and if you remember the man who is who is stepping out on his wife uh, looking out the window the example from last time he's he's doing what he hate he loves his wife and yet he allowed the lust of his flesh to control him. And so that's where he is, under condemnation and guilt. And it doesn't get any better from here because it what, what he gets in this next section here, on this next section, he gets remotivated. He's so appalled, so um, incensed that he could allow himself to do this, not realizing that he's not strong enough. He's not able. He hasn't come to that point, or he wouldn't be remotivated. He would fall on his face and realize, I need you, God. I can't do this. But until he, he falls on his face, until he realizes he's going to keep going through this cycle over year after year sometimes, I can relate to small issues like yelling at your children uh, and getting a bad habit of, of walking down the flesh of, of uh, raising your voice to your children. Or it could be, you know, drug addiction or um, cheating on your wife or cheating on your husband. Either way, it's the same cycle that, uh, that we see. And so... The remotivated is the fifth one. Um, it's, six, it's verses 16 through 21. In 16, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. When you actually engage in living according to the law, you're saying it's good and right and it works. And until you step off that path, until God, you yield and allow God to, to take you off that path, you're saying it works and it's, it's the right thing to do. And you are exalted and you are playing religion. Verse 17, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Um, verse 17, it's the sin that's causing the problem and it dwells within. It can't be done away. And until we acknowledge the strength, the power and strength of sin in our lives, even as a believer, it never goes away. That doesn't leave. It's, it's the fleshly thinking that's still in our mind. That's why God says, have your mind renewed. If you don't renew the, your mind daily, that comes back as our default. 
<clears throat> verse 18. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. You can try every avenue, every trial, get remotivated to, to attempt it in a different way. Reinforce yourself, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. However, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. If we can understand that, it's dumb. It's filthy rags. Whenever we do it, from the little things to the big things, they just burn away. And so what we want to do is have a life pleasing to God and yielding to Him. Uh, verse 19, For the good that I would, I do not, even though you might have the heart, the desire to do it. Your flesh is unable. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Over and over and over, it can be very frustrating as a grace believer, knowing all these, this data, this doctrine, understanding some things, the verses, but it's not here to live it out. It's elusive. It seems like we just can't access it because we need to think differently. We need to think God's way. Okay, so... Um, Verse 20, now, if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. God's, God separated us from sin, and it is no more I that do it, it's sin that dwelleth in me. If you don't recognize that, you'll see both is one, and you will be continuing in the condemnation. You are separated. That sin is not who you are. Christ is in you. You're a new creation. That's who you are. Verse 20, uh, let's see, 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. No matter how hard we try, even when we give money to the poor, there is an aspect in us looking for adoration, looking for something that will exalt the flesh when we do that, if we're doing it in our flesh. We can't do anything, not even giving money or helping people, unless we're yielding to God and allowing Christ to manifest himself by his word in and through us. So we find ourselves again at the, the, the next step, failure. Failure and sin is manifested Again, and there's self, there's condemnation, guilt, and powerlessness. We, we can't, we can't do it. And we're just going to keep up with this cycle over and over and over. Um, it's the same thing. And this last one is verses 22 through 23. Um, it says, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And that's where this person is, um, where we all are. We're in captivity to the law of sin that's in our members. However, God wants us to use our members for him. He wants our members quickened. He wants us to be able, the deeds of this body, to bring forth fruit unto righteousness. So what we do is we come to the point where, it, where we're in verse 24, and it says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Help me. Who's going to help me, Lord? I can't do this. That's the place you want to be. Who shall deliver me? The answer is the next verse. It gives you a, a glimpse of what he's going to go over in chapter 8. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. The problem, as we walk down this road, we're serving the law of the flesh. That's not... The, uh, but with the flesh, the law of sin, that's what the verse says. 
But what we do to serve him is with the mind we serve the law of God. And so we have to think differently, and we need that renewed mind. Um, uh, remember from last time, um, recall that mountain of treasure that I, I stored up as a kid of my good works. And I realized it was all that treasure with filthy rags accumulated over those years of all my good works and they all burn away. It's a dunghill. It was just so mind altering, mind blowing really, but it helped me to see God's perspective, Christ and his life in me was the only wisdom and power able to stop the cycle. If we continue on our own, if we don't fall on our face and go to him in prayer and uh, realize it's his word working in us, we'll stay stuck in that sin cycle and not gain victory. <clears throat> uh, first Corinthians, or, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Let's go there. This is an interesting verse. It says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting the holiness in the fear of God. It says, Cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Our spirit is tainted. It's tainted by the pattern of fleshly works that we're living and our, we live out our flesh, and that's not what we want to do. We want to perfect holiness in the fear of God. There's only one way to do that, and that is with a renewed mind. Think about that verse. That's a powerful verse. Um, as we renew our mind, we take the precious time and resources away from fulfilling the lust of the flesh. We don't want to do it. It's hard. The things we see, feel, and touch, those are the things that really we feel are real. And sometimes why we don't make any change is because we really don't see God and his, um, his spiritual realm, the word and prayer as real. But that's the real reality. That's, we, that's the only way that grace is going to reign. And so we want to um, al allow ourselves to be edified God's way. And as we perform it, God's, God's way is slow. It doesn't happen quick, slow and steady. We put one foot in front of the other. We renew our mind. We apply it. We try it out. We make our mistakes. We keep walking by faith. If we get off the wrong path, we, we yield and get back on the right road as who we are in Christ. And we're, each time we do that, we're a little wiser. We're a little stronger. We, we are able to walk a little more godly in, in, in on the godly path and produce uh, fruit unto holiness. And really, God is silently waiting. He's not screaming at us like our flesh is screaming at us to do all the things we ought not to do. God's not screaming. He's holding forth the word. In fact, it's right in your Bible. If you don't pick it up, if you don't think about it, are you really listening? He's holding it forth. Listen. Uh, thank you. I think we'll stop there. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your word. Help us to understand and think on these things in your precious Son's name. Amen.